Hello, welcome to Insight. I'm Wendy Brokaw. Nez Perce in Oregon, Removal and Return, a virtual exhibit funded by the Oregon State Capital Foundation, is running now through June 30th. You can see it free at OregonCapital.com. It traces Nez Perce history in Oregon from prehistory through its removal from its native Oregon and return. My guest is exhibit curator Rich Wand Schneider of the Josephi Center for Arts and Culture in Joseph, Oregon, named for Western history writer Alvin Josephi, honoring his lifetime effort to tell the true story of the Nez Perce. Rich, how did you land in Joseph? I landed in Joseph in 1971. I was fresh out of five years in the Peace Corps, mostly in Turkey, and I got a job with the Oregon State University Extension Service as a community development worker in Wallowa County. I came here in 71. I had a one-year contract, and uh, one year has become 52. <laughs> and then very early on, I met Alvin Josephi. And that, uh, uh, after five years with the Extension Service, I opened a bookstore and in Enterprise. And that's when Elvin and I really got together when he was still working at American Heritage Magazine and he'd come out in the summers and uh, the first place he'd stop was the bookstore. You told me that he had some thoughts on the Nez Perce and the grim reality that they faced in life. What was that choice? Well, I think we talked about one thing I said, as he studied and he really got in, in, immersed in native history of, of the continent, Alvin said that the Indians from the get-go, from the time the first Europeans got here, had three choices. Their choices were to move and get out of the way of us because we want the land. Their second choice was to become white. Um, and uh, the third choice was to die. And that choice he felt followed as as Europeans, Euro-Americans moved across the continent, the cha same choice occurred over and over and over again. So that uh, by the time we get to 1877, we're at the end of what is called the Indian Wars. And again, the choice is move, and that's when they shrink the size of the reservation to make more room for more whites. So that's one choice, move, or take up an allotment on the, uh, uh, or, or, you know, somehow or another become white, become a, become a, a rancher or farmer or, a, for, you know, something else, or uh, go to war. And that's what eventually happened. How did this exhibit come about? It embraces all of what you're telling us. Yeah. Well, the exhibit, I don't remember how I got word that the Capitol uh, was embarked on a project to put up a series of exhibits. I think they wanted to do four exhibits each year. And to, to, to talk about and explain some important aspect of Oregon history or culture or politics. And so I saw that and said, well, there's this story of the Nez Perce Indians who were once in Oregon and then were forcibly removed from Oregon and are now making their way back in. So I wrote up kind of a of a sketch of what I would do with an exhibit. I sent it to every Indian elder I knew. And, <laughs> and I got a couple of pretty good replies. And I want to give a shout out right now to Bobby Connor, who's the director at Tomustalik, who uh, said, among other things, Rich, you have to stop with start with water. We were water people before we were horse people. Um, we were tied to the land and to water. And so uh, 
Uh, and I'd known from Bobby and others before that, that at some place along the way, we were going to have to get into the doctrine of discovery too, because the doctrine of discovery sits behind the treaties and sits behind everything that in terms of Indian relations or native relations. Um, well, let's talk about that exhibit. And um, I've gone through it myself and I get more out of it every single time I do. Could you please tell me how it's organized? It's pretty easy to mark major events in uh, North American, especially United States history vis-a-vis -vis tribes along a timeline. In other words, we had the original intrusion of Euro of Europeans, uh, the the advent of first of diseases, and then we had from the Southwest and the Spaniards, we had them bringing horses, and uh, fur trade brought guns, and that so Indians were evolving as as white and then slave America was evolving. Um, and uh, uh, so that's kind of the first phase, displacement. And that really, really comes to a head in 1830 with President Jackson and Indian removal. We are going to take every Indian east of the Mississippi and move them west of the Mississippi to that Oklahoma till Indian territory, which eventually becomes America. So that's 1830. And by the way, that's also the time, at, uh, we, at least when I was in school, we didn't get this in our history books, but Justice Marshall uh, at that time um, in the 1820s and 30s, there are three decisions that are the basis of Indian law in America, the Marshall decisions. And he harks back to the doctrine of discovery. That's in our, you know, in our <laughs> law books now. The doctrine of discovery, you're talking about the a series of papal bulls from the yes. Vatican way back when in the 1500s? In the 1400s. 1400s. Yeah. Where and, were they? And what they said, essentially, that as a Christian nation coming on heathen lands can claim that it discovered those lands and can claim them for its sovereign. Okay? He was, at first... Uh, um, there were disputes between the Portuguese and the Spanish, and then the but the English picked it up, and they even after they got away from the, from the Catholic Church and and had their own church, uh, which uh, uh, had happened by the time of uh, uh, the initial uh, settling of uh, Anglo America. Um, uh, they had uh, borrowed the doctrine of discovery. And Marshall, in 1823 to 30 or whatever, said that basically the United States owns the land. Indian tribes don't own the land. The United States own the land. Indians can occupy it, but they don't own it. We, the government, own the land, and we dispose of it with uh, homesteads and whatnot. So uh, that, that's a, a next big phase. And then I, um, in our time, going back to our timeline, then we go through um, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, fur trade, the missionaries, the, uh, uh, the treaty period, and uh, then uh, further attempts at assimilation with boarding schools and allotment acts and right to today where we're seeing a revival and re-emergence of uh, Indian cultures and languages. What happened in 1855 that was a signal event in the lives of the Nez Perce? Okay, in 1855, uh, a, a fellow named Isaac Stevens, a 36-year-old West Point graduate who had done some good turns for President Fillmore uh, was given three jobs. He was to be the Indian agent for Washington Territory and the um, uh, governor of Washington Territory 
and the surveyor of a western of a northern railroad route. He calls a great conference in what's now Walla Walla for all of the Plateau tribes, meaning the tribes from Yakima down to Warm Springs and and uh, the the Umatilla Walla Walla Nez Perce. He wanted to shove all of these tribes onto one or at the most two reservations. So basically what's Yakima and what's Umatilla now. Uh, but the uh, the Nez Perce came to that treaty meeting with 2000 people on horseback. And the image we have on the exhibit is uh, by Sohan, the, draw, the, the artist who was at the exhibit and uh, or at the, the treaty meeting. And he did this, this uh, terrific uh, drawing of the Nez Perce arrival. And so Stevens and, and, and his Oregon uh, uh, counterpart, Joel uh, Palmer, who was the Indian agent for Oregon at the time, for uh, Oregon Territory, we were still not a state in 1855. And they, uh, uh, they decide that maybe the Nez Perce should get their own reservation. Uh, and so they did. But as all too often happens, in American history, gold comes up, and gold, gold, gold is gold. covered in Idaho on the reservation, and all of a sudden, by in 1860, by 1862, there are 15,000 illegal white miners on the Nez Perce reservation, and Joseph at that treaty meeting uh, is very important that, that Joseph did not sign that treaty, and uh, nor did a few other chiefs. And so that basically divided the tribe into treaty, treaty bands, and the Nez Perce and all these plateau types. This is going backwards, but they were all organized in bands. They weren't. There was not one leader who was the chief of all the Nez Perce or the chief of all the Umatilla or the chief of all the Cayuse. There were bands that that lived on specific geographic areas. Were and, and moved, moved constantly uh, uh, in food gathering and, and living, but they, they had no one overlord or overseer. Uh, and so when the Treaty of 1863 happens, uh, uh, the, some of the chiefs sign, mostly the ones that had land on that reservation already or on the, that part of it. And and it also kind of divided it up between Christians and non-Christians because there had been missionaries there working with some, specifically with some of the bands there. So it, that, so that's 1863, but Joseph comes back here and there aren't any white people here. There's no problem for a few years. And then in 1871, white settlers kind of come over the hill from, uh, from the Grand Ronde Valley and at that same year, old Joseph dies, and his um, his son, uh, who the settlers called young young Chief Joseph or Chief Young Joseph, um, takes over as the leadership of this group of Nez Perce. In 1877, the government decides that all of these non-treaty bands have to get have to pick up and move and leave their ancestral homelands and go to this much smaller reservation in Idaho. And the Indians resist as long as they can. And in 1877, they're given 30 days to be there. And Joseph, not wanting war, because he's threatened, we're going to move you. if it... So he takes his people and they cross the Snake River in, the, in, in spring flood at this time of year. And uh, when they're on the other side, some young Indians taunt each other. You know, there's a settler up the road there that killed your uncle or father or whoever. And some young Indians kill some uh, white settlers who had been known as Indian-hating white settlers. And pretty soon that evolves into the Nez Perce War. Um, and General Howard, the one who who had uh, come up with the, you have 30 days to move, um, is, uh, is the antagonist of the non-treaty Nez Perce during that war. And they go almost 1,400 miles and five months 
and a fighting retreat. They go through Yellowstone, which is already a national park, and they capture tourists and let them go. Most of them, I think one or two tourists were killed. Um, and they get to, they're 40 miles from the Canadian border and, uh, um, and Chief Sitting Bull of the Sioux is across the border and they want to get there and they don't make it. Uh, they stop in, at the Bear Paw in, Mountains in, in Montana and their um, uh, Joseph, by then, uh, I, I meant to say, Joseph was never a war chief. He was always kind of the domestic chief and the diplomat, really. But the war chiefs had been killed, uh, his brother Olicott being one of them. And he, I think, purposefully dawdled for about a day. And a couple hundred Nespers actually made it, uh, a mostly white bird band, made it into Canada. But uh, the rest uh, were captured, so to speak. They turned in their weapons. Um, and they thought they were going to winter somewhere, maybe at Fort Keogh in Montana, and then return to Idaho. But uh, the United States government had other plans and they went ended up in Indian territory, <clears throat> which they called the hot place. Many, many of them more died. In 1885, uh, Joseph made two trips to Washington, D.C., made a spectacular speech in saying, basically, when you treat us, when, when, when all people are treated equally, uh, we can live alongside you as, as brothers. Uh, but we can't have two sets of laws, one for Indians and one for whites. Um, it's a brilliant speech, um, translated, of course, because he's speaking in Nez Um But in 1885, they're allowed to come west again to the northwest, but not to Oregon. Okay. Why was that? Why uh, not Oregon? We didn't want them. They were to go, well, and we, there was no reservation here, right? There was no Nez Perce reservation. There was Umatilla. And that's another chapter. There, there, was, there had been some, some efforts to make Joseph move to the Umatilla reservation. Uh, but at any rate, um, so they get on a train in Indian Territory, and they come back to basically Wallula Junction, and there are about 300 of them. And half of them are allowed to, uh, or choose to go or allowed to go to Lapway and join their relatives there. Uh, Joseph is there's a warrant out for his arrest in Idaho, too. So he can't go there and he can't go to Oregon. So Joseph and about 150 go to the Colville Reservation in Washington. And so that uh, what was known as the Wawama Band or oftentimes called the Joseph Band, ends up in on the Colville Reservation in Washington, where they still are. So now some of the Nez Perce made it back from Canada or from places around the war route to Umatilla, to the Umatilla Reservation. And some, there was a lot of intermarriage, so there's a Umatilla Cayuse, I mean a, a Nez Perce Cayuse group on the Umatilla Reservation. But the Nez Perce do not have an official reservation presence in Oregon to this day. How are they slowly returning to Oregon and to their native traditions here in Oregon? Uh, you know, this is a, it's a great story, and it's part of a national story that over the last 20 or 30 years, we have gradually seen a reemergence of Indian tribes, of Indian languages, of cultures, and the Nez Perce are definitely a part of that. Uh, the Treaty of 1855, and that language was carried over into 1863, said that, yeah, the Indians were had to live on these prescribed lands, but they were allowed to hunt, fish, gather roots and berries, and graze their horses and their cattle in usual and accustomed places off of reservation ground. This usual and accustomed places and what we 
called at the time the Fish Wars in Oregon and Washington, and something called the Bolt Decision, the Indians get half the salmon on the on the Columbia River at a certain point. That half the salmon going to their traditional areas, and uh, and then the further interpretation of that interpretation is well, if they get half the salmon, there have to be salmon. So, so the Bonneville Power Administration basically uh, provides the money for tribal fisheries in Umatilla and Nez Perce, and salmon runs are being restored. Okay, and and we have a big Nez Perce fisheries office here. Uh, so that's here. Fisheries are happening. Um, land purchases, easements. The Willow Lake Lodge has an easement for spawning grounds up at the lake. Uh, uh, every time you turn around, something new and good is happening in Indian country. Until we get to see the actual 10 panel exhibit in person at the state capitol, we have this wonderful virtual exhibit. What are your hopes for it? Getting the Nesper story straight, I think, is important. And uh, I hope that people will go from this to reading uh, there are now Nez Perce writers, as there are writers from every tribe, uh, and uh, there are Nez Perce artists. In fact, we have one of the images in our exhibit is by a, it's a wonderful image of uh, uh, by a Nez Perce artist, John Grant. Um, of uh, uh, we use it to illustrate Tamalwat the the uh, the notion. Uh, Bobby Connor again told me one time, you know, she said, people think that before the white man came, we didn't have laws. Well, we had laws and we had what's called Tamawa. We had natural law and our natural law was all about reciprocity. It was about the land and the animals and the birds and the fish took care of us. And we in turn were obliged to take care of them. Simple concept, but that was law. That was law. And uh, I think maybe we in the United States and today and in the world are coming around to thinking, yeah, that, that makes some sense, doesn't it? Nespers people and tribal people in general are now feeling more comfortable coming back to us and coming back into their... Uh, we have a sculpture out here called Etuewisa, uh, which means return from a dis difficult journey. And that's the last little blurb on our on our virtual exhibit is a little three or four minute video of Doug Hyde, who's a Nez Perce artist. Um, that was funded by uh, Oregon Community Foundation, Creative Heights, easiest grant I ever wrote. I said, there are 12, bronzes, 12 bronzes on Main Street in Joseph, four of them depict Indians, none of them done by an Indian artist. Oh, here's some money. <laughs> and so we sought out Indian artists and hired, uh, Doug Hyde, and it was his con concept. Uh, there's a granite slab which represents the Wallows. The mountains are carved on top, and there's a figure of a human <coughs> carved out of the granite slab. And then she, the Nez Perce woman in bronze, is walking back towards it. And uh, and it is called a was a, which means I hope I'm pronouncing that pretty close to right return from a difficult journey. What I hope people would take away from the exhibit is, is uh, the notion of, of return and making things right and doing right. Rich, this has been a wonderful tour of this extraordinary virtual exhibit. I can't thank you enough. Rich Juan Schneider, he is the exhibit a curator and he also is with the alvin josephi cultural arts and cultural center in joseph oregon what is the address how do we get your website how do you well josephi joseph with a y on it josephi.org and uh the library we actually if you go to the josephi.org page you can click on a thing that says library and get to me and i uh as you see, as you know, today, I like to talk and I like I have a blog, but we also have directions towards our collection and uh, 
not only physical books, but uh, digital collections, et cetera. Um, and we have, we're on Main Street in Joseph. Are we 403 DJ? Yes. 403 North Main. <laughs> in Joseph, Oregon. Uh, the big, the big, pretty uh, log building on the right as you come into town. Well, thank you. Everybody should go there and they should also take advantage of this virtual exhibit while they're still here and really get much, much more out of it than we've been able to talk about here. Okay. Rich, thank you for being my guest today on Insight. Thank you very much, Wendy. It was enjoyable. And uh, um, I'm here for questions and comments. Oh, and don't criticism. ask. I might bring coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today on Insight. I'm Wendy Brokaw. We're asking for a plateau artist to give his or her interpretation of the land and the soul of this place. Here are these people that are so significant to our community, and where are they? I have longed to have something on our main street that genuinely represents the Native American energy and spirit that is here. We're grateful for having been called upon today to this, our ancestral home, for we are descendants of the Joseph Band of this person who once made their home in this area. I honor this gentleman as a descendant also of our people. When you create something like a sculpture, you see it in your mind first. Within a matter of minutes, I could see this thing. I had to do some drawings and, you know, a clay model, but I pretty well knew exactly what I wanted to do. The concept was the removal of the Nez Perce from the valley and silhouette the top of the mountains to represent the valley. And then the big vacant space in there, which is in the shape of a woman, was removal. And that also it's a little spiritual because the wind and weather can go through that portion of it. I chose the red color because it's very native and granite is so permanent. It represented the mountains. And it represented the people that lived here. The return was the bronze coming back into the valley. She has a corn husk bag and on her corn husk bag is a star, the Nez Perce star. And then on her sleeves is dogwood plants on each side of her. Besides being my mom's favorite tree, I was trying to think of incorporating my family as part of this. My mom, she spoke the old language and she would talk to all the old people, but there was so much slang added to the language and I was kind of out of respect for her as I did that. It's very symbolic, every bit of it. I'm really appreciative to Doug for making his sculpture of a woman. I think that's important. So much has been written about our men, but very little attention has been paid to American Indian women. The Wallawa Valley citizens are really nice. You welcome us home, but you need to know the land welcomes us. The land is happy that we're here. And it's a very big day when all of us get to come together for something like this to a homecoming where there are people from all three reservations and people who have traveled far to pay homage to not only our ancestors, but to our future here in this valley because we look forward to a rich and wonderful relationship with our homeland in the future. Thank you.